life can be full of things that we long to come to an end. But God gives us a new day. The sun rises whether we find joy or sorrow. This world is filled with disappointments and hurts. And God wants to comfort us even in the darkness as the sky is filled with stars in our darkest hour. It is a reminder of how much God loves us. Even in the darkness, he always lets the light shine. And if we can hold fast to that, we can find comfort. The pain is real. The hurt is real. All the things we go through can be very, very real. God does not diminish these things, but he wants us to find courage and strength to face them through his power and his might. That the sun did come up for you. That the sun is always there because it's the sun of righteousness that brings healing in his wings. That's who comes to us each and every day. Oftentimes we're looking to be happy in our lives and we just really don't understand why things are not going the way we hoped they would. But God is always in control. Contentment is a wonderful thing. But a lot of times in our society today, we we confuse contentment with other things. And society tells us the things that we have are not adequate or that God is not with us. But he always is in this world we live in today. They try to tell us that the contentment is the same thing as being happy. If you're not happy, then you're not content. And oftentimes society tells us that happiness is because of something that we want, because of something that we desire. Not necessarily being content where you are, but always striving to have something that maybe is beyond your reach that can cause you great sorrow trying to attain the thing society will tell you that brings contentment. The contentment that Christ brings does not require us to seek something that will hurt us in the long run. The contentment that Christ offers is not about being happy. It's not always about how you feel. It's about the assurance that God loves you. Now, I found this particular quote on the Internet. And I thought it was so interesting. It had this picture of this gentleman that looked like he was from the 1500s or something. And he was smiling and going on. And the definition it had in there by contentment, I thought was very interesting. Contentment is a mental or an emotional state of satisfaction. May be drawn from being at ease in one's situation. Body and mind, colloquially speaking, Contentment could be a state of having accepted one situation and it and is a milder and more tentative form of happiness. See, society tells us that even though we're going through something and we have accepted the situation, it's never just all the way contentment. It always has something to do in conjunction with happiness. You know, because the situation has changed, you have lost something, and so you basically just accepted the loss and you submit to this. You're not happy all the way, but you you just accept it, so you got a little bit of happiness here. But that's not how God looks at it. Contentment in the mind of God, like it says in the beginning, he kind of gets it right. Contentment is a mental or emotional state of satisfaction. So your contentment starts in your head, you know. Romans 12, 2 tells us that let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So it starts in the mind. Your contentment comes within your mind. What you think about your situation, what you think about yourself and your relationship with God will determine your contentment, not whether the situation has now become milder or you've just accepted the bad situation and you're a little bit happy, not as happy as you were, but you're a little bit happy. But God is not here to offer us absolute happiness in every situation. In this journey home, there's going to be disappointments. And in that disappointment, we must find the same contentment that Christ gave us through his life. His life was not easy. He lived a life as basically an itinerant preacher. He had no church. He had a small following of 12 men and some other people who were following him from place to place. But the leaders of his church 
in his day did not accept him so his contentment was in doing the will of god not necessarily in the acceptance of those who were telling him that he should live a more quiet state of being i'm sure because he was one who lived for the people and uh, constantly doing his life and the record of the gospels christ was constantly under attack for ministering to those who needed him to most so his happiness was not something that was based on what he had he had true contentment in his mission I looked up the word contentment and content in the Greek the word translates into self satisfaction that's contentment and then content is a little different meaning in the Greek it implies like you raising a barrier properly to ward off something you know i.e. by implication to avail yourself of something figuratively be satisfactory be content be enough suffice be sufficient and for me be sufficient was always the case because God was always my sufficient and he was always my sufficient in all of my situations so regardless of what was going on the con to be content had nothing to do with me or the situation and had everything to do with God. Now, in contentment, that's found in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So God's ideal for us is not contentment in the concept of laying on a, a sofa, no worries, no stress. But godliness, living oh, the way God would have us live, is true contentment in the eyes of God. And it is great gain. It is a, it's worth having. It's of great value. And it, as Timothy goes on to say, he said, we, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. So... He uses both of these words. The concept of contentment is self-satisfaction. But godliness with self-satisfaction is great gain. So being self-satisfied in the context of God is having a godly life. To live a life that brings joy to those around regardless to what you have. If you have above just food and raiment, praise the Lord. You have much to share with those around you. So this is why it is not based on your situation, but it is based on the things that God values. Now, content, Paul mentions this in Hebrews. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. You can see these both these scriptures reflect the same view that to be content is wrapped up in accepting your lot with God doing all you can do following the will of God I'm not saying if you're poor don't go to school don't seek to do better but that you seek these things with the godliness is great gain to be your guide to let God help you raise up a barrier against those things that will separate you from him that contentment never works outside of God you can chase all the worldly things you want but they bring no contentment so Paul goes on to say here in Hebrews, he says, uh, For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. When you in your darkest hour, as I said, God was almost always my be sufficient. Because regardless to what was going on, it was sufficient with God. Because he was the one who was going to work it out. He's always the one who's going to show me the way. Don't care what was going on or how long I had to stay in that situation. If I put the king of heaven in play and let him walk in the front, I would find the grace to endure, the strength to go on, to know that he will never leave me nor forsake me. Now, Paul says in Philippians, not that I speak in respect of want, but I have learned in what service state I am therewith to be content. I know how know both how to be a base, I know how to abound everywhere, and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I 
can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Many times we quote the last part, but we miss the fact that sometimes you may be hungry. Sometimes you may be in a bad situation or you may be in, in a very terrible conflict with someone or in a bad place on a job this is this is part of life but what we have to realize i can do all things it doesn't say that he will take away the the hunger or the being abased or to abound he lets you know you're going to be in some some terrible situations whether you like them or not god is still god and he will see you through. He will give you the strength to go through whatever it is you're going through. And it's not always what you like. Satisfaction. We read that before that contentment is self-satisfaction. Okay. Now, here's the definition of happy in considering what Paul said in Philippians. I can do all things. And the world's definition you can find is very different than what the Bible says. You know, here we found contentment meant self-satisfaction. Here, happy from the being.com, feeling or showing pleasure or contentment. Self-satisfaction, okay? Fortunate and convenient, okay? Inclined to use a specific thing excessively or at random things that make you happy see it's all tied to something that you're interacting with your mood or your feelings is tied to your contentment or pleasure based on what you have or what you can use and the dictionary.com says delighted pleased or glad as over a particular thing characterized by or indicative or pleasure contentment or joy Favored by fortune, fortunate, or lucky. So, you know, this is, as you can see, the worldly definition of happy or the concept of contentment is not what the Bible says as we read the definitions from the Strong's. Now, this is where it's at in the Strong's. The word happy, supremely blessed, by extension fortunate, well off blessed happy happier so the bible has something to say about this and this is how it is used i picked this particular scripture because it's in john 13 15 through 17 and this is christ's view it says for i have given you an example that you should do as i have done unto you he had washed the disciples feet Verily, verily, I say unto you, that the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. So, as you look at the world's definition of happy, it's implied to what you have access to, what you can use, or what you can do that makes you happy. But Christ's implication of happy is service to others being not so well how can i say appreciated because the disciples were contending over who was the greatest and yet the lord of heaven the master of the universe washed these men's dirty feet as he's on his way to the cross so christ's definition of happy is not tied to the things that we have Christ's definition of happy is tied to service and sacrifice, which takes away our concept of being discontent. We, are, we have self-satisfaction because now it's not tied to the things of this world. We are content because that's not what we're seeking. We are seeking to do what the master did. He says, by extension, fortunate, well off. You are well off. You are highly blessed if you are in service to those who need you so desperately just as Christ washed the feet of those who really didn't understand his mission now we just read the happy thing but let's look at this other scripture now this is first Peter 3 14 through 15 but if you suffer for righteousness sake happy are ye and be not afraid of their terror neither be troubled but sanctify the lord god in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you 
which with meekness and fear once again you see happiness in adversity if you live in a good life and you find yourself being abused and misused i'm not saying you're supposed to stay in an abusive situation you're supposed to do all you can to live a godly life if the law needs to be called if you need to distance yourself if you need to make a move or whatever you need to do to live a godly life god does not require us to be terrorized by those who don't care for us but when you are serving christ and people are unhappy about the righteousness your life exemplifies it can be terrifying and troubling at times but what you have to realize is be sanctified but sanctify the Lord in your heart so where are you in your inner self don't let these things that you are going through separate you from God and know that you are the apple of the Lord's eye when you're going through this thing think about what we just read about Christ washing the disciples feet he on his way to Calvary they don't really understand his mission yet and yet he tells them you will be happy when you do these things you will be happy when you serve others so as your life reflects your service with your God and people are discontent with you and they treat you unfairly and they do things to you then you will find that peace in your heart even though the circumstances are not happy you are truly blessed as God will see you through now this is the last scripture about being happy and content it's we find this in first Peter beloved think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. This is not a promise that our lives will be easy, but just as Christ suffered and endured, you have to remember the master grew up in a poverty-stricken home. He suffered every day. He worked to help his, his, his uh, stepfather or his father on the earthly father uh, to make a living as a carpenter this was no easy task in that day and age he grew up in nazareth which was a terrible place you know robbers and thieves it was not the best part of town to live in this is where the son of god grew up the king of heaven laid down all the wonders of his home to come here to endure so much that he could offer us the tree of life that we could one day stand before the throne of God to find ourselves in a place we've never been and that is the Garden of Eden so he endured all of this and he encourages us not to think it's some strange thing when adversity comes our way that we're not being picked on that Christ endured this and so much more that the concept of happy that the world offers is not what Christ offers he offers us the blessed happy to be blessed to be fortunate to be well off not in this world's goods but well off in the things of heaven that one day we shall receive the riches of heaven and the scripture goes on to say that to say that when his glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy when Christ comes in the clouds of heaven the suffering we have endured here will be nothing heaven will truly be cheap enough if ye be reproached for the name of Christ happy are ye happy that that's not something that the world promises us something specific thing that we could excessively or at random be using or inclined to use or delight or pleasure happiness in having the same adversities in our lives living in a world of sin and living a godly life will make us happy not in this world's eyes but because we see something that is beyond for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you think of that that the Spirit of God rests upon you in your adversity, going through your trial, that the Spirit of God rests on you. Now, and the scripture goes on to say, on their part, he is evil spoken of, those who are hurting you. But on your part, he is glorified because you can endure this, seeing something beyond 
what is happening in your life at that time. So this is what Christ has promised us, not the things that we hope for in this world or that the world tells us, well, there's something wrong with you because, you know, why are you so happy? <laughs> you know, I've had that told to me. Why? Because I see something beyond in the midst of my tears, in the midst of my brokenness and heart, in the midst of my sorrow. There is something greater and that is beyond. And all I got to do is endure this little light affliction until the king of glory shall come. You know, I said at the beginning, Christ was my be sufficient. He's my all in all. You know, as Paul is reflecting on his, his situation at that time up there in Philippians, he lets us know that situations change through our choices or even circumstances beyond our control. He has learned as we saw in Philippians, that God is always in control. So Paul wasn't worried. The situations are not always pleasant, but God is in control and will see you through. That is the key. That's what will give us that contentment, that happy concept that God has promised, not as the world gives, because all of this is going to be gone. So that pain and sorrow we feel at times because of the adversity in our lives that is so real. Looking beyond the situation and seeing the hope that is before us will give us the endurance we need to be able to be able to be happy not as the world says but to be happy knowing that Christ is soon to come and all of this we're going through now will be traded for something far better than anything we could ever imagine now this is Philippians 4 11, 13 again where Paul tells us that being happy is not about your circumstance. It's about through Christ I can do all things. That's the key. Because it's through his strength that we as Christians continue to live a contented, happy life in the context of God's rules. Not the rules of society. The rules of society will make us feel like we're being cheated. You know. And that's not what we want to feel because God is more than able to do for us greater than we could think you know when we look at the things we go through we have to realize that as we're ministering to someone else even through our adversity it is God's view of God's view to show us what to do not our view it is God's view the souls we uh, minister to need us to have a clear vision because we're not here alone. Sometimes we let silly words or people say silly stuff to us and we have to remember Christ is laughing because he has something far better for us than anything we could ever imagine. Jesus is laughing because he has something so wonderful, so glorious, that these folks who are causing all this adversity, who think they have the upper hand, doesn't even understand. They are thinking small. They are trying to limit the power of God to bless us in many ways. They have a small experience with God or don't even believe in God. And they think we should have their experience. They are not asking what is God's will for our life. They are looking at what they think we should do with our life. And that's the key. It is not about what they think, but it is about what God thinks. We need to ask what does God want us to do with our life? So, Paul is reflecting, as I said earlier, on his situation. And he knows that the situations come and go. And as, as the statement says here that I wrote, you know, he knows the situation can change through our choices or circumstances beyond our control. But the main point to know, he knows that God is always in control and will see us through so God has a ministry for all of us and it is so important for us to let God tell us what to do with our life not to look at the smallness of other people who try to tell us God has no plan for your life or wants you to embrace the concept of happiness and contentment from a worldly view but that's not right when you're going through your experiences and you're having your hard times, this world is no easy place to live in. 
You know, people ask me how I come I'm so happy. God is good in the midst of the fire. He is still God. Now, this is 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 28. And I think all of us know this. This is the scripture where Paul talks about all the stuff that he had been through. And as you think about Philippians, when he's talking about, I can do all things through Christ who can strengthen me, who strengthens me. Think about what Paul went through. And I put the, the highlight here. And you can turn to first, uh, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 28. And you can read it. But I'm just going to hit these things in red. He was in prison. He was always at the threat of somebody killing him. The Jews, uh, five times he received 40 stripes, said one. That means they beat that man with a whip 39 times. They stripped his back. They did to him what they did to Christ. And that happened to him five times through his countrymen, the Jews who did not accept the Savior. Three times or thrice I was beaten with rods. Now, to understand that, you got to look at your curtain rod, thick curtain rod. That's what they were using on him. And they, they hit him 39 times. They figured if they hit you 40, they'd kill you. I'm so sure that 39 brought you to the, to the point of death. So that that happened to him three times. And that one time he was stoned. Remember, they left him out there for dead. Three times he sh- suffered shipwreck. And he was the, the ship sunk and he hanging on to some wood a night and a day out there in the water. So he was in perils in the water. And then he was traveling everywhere. There were robbers and thieves in the mountains and paths he was taking. There was no police or highway patrol. And he was in peril by his own countrymen as he was preaching the risen Savior. And they were trying to kill him. All you got to do is read the New Testament, especially through Acts and, and, and the other books in the New Testament that he wrote. They were always trying to kill him. He was in peril from heathens, people who didn't know about God and just the citizens of that area. You know, in peril in the city. He be in the wilderness. He out there at sea. False brethren, brothers in the church trying to sell him out and hurt him. You know, he was weary and, and I'm sure a lot of times he had pain and swollen feet and watching, you know, always fearful. He was hungry. He had thirst. He was fasting or still hungry in the cold. And I'm sure his clothes would wear out. He didn't have enough clothes when it was cold. But those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul went through all of this. And he said that Christ strengthened him through all of this, and yet he was a faithful minister of the gospel. Our adversity at times, the world will make the things we do for God look so terrible. You know, we die daily to self. So that, you know, it means that's a moving experience. That's not a stagnant experience. That's a daily changing experience. And moving forward and allowing God to be in our lives the God who wants to change us into who he would have us be. You know, it gets a little scary sometimes. But if you'll be sufficient or your God or whichever way you want to think about the Father is there with you, you truly can do all things. It don't say all things is going to be good, but contentment does not come to the child of God the way the world will want you to think you're being cheated because it doesn't. And that's the key of this video. Your contentment is not based on worldly contentment. You're going to have sorrows and disappointment. People are going to let you down. You're going to wonder what's happening in your life because so much stuff is going wrong. But what you have to do is you have to search within those things and find your way to think about all of this stuff Paul went through and yet he still was a faithful pastor. He still was a faithful servant. He still served his God in the midst of all of this. I probably would have quit after that first experience with that 39 stripes. He, they did that to him five times. That, that, that is mind-blowing to me. They beat this man with a whip 39 times. And I'm sure they was not tickling him. I'm sure it took the flesh off his back. That happened to him five times. And we're not going to talk about the healing. And the saints have to come get him and try to bandage up his wounds. And he laying there on his stomach. Or he got to leave town you know, half bleeding and everything, and all of that pain, he still had to walk somewhere. 
we complain sometimes about things that are so small because the devil will make us think that we are being taken advantage of. True contentment is being in the will of God. Sin separates us from that contentment. We begin to look for stuff to buy or to own, to bring into our experience. And we think that will make that contentment work, but it never does. Only to find that we are still empty because there's something missing. Surrendering our life to Christ at the cross is the beginning of that contentment. It didn't say happiness as the, I didn't say happiness as the world gives. It's not that. It never will be. You will always have the disappointment of expectations that have not come true. If you as a Christian, as a son or daughter of the living God, try to mix the concept of contentment and happiness that the world defines with the contentment and happy that God defines, you will always be off base and you will always be disappointed. The happiness God promises found in surrender and service. May happiness and, and contentment the world promises is in selfishness and having what you want that makes you feel good. The two will never work. So if you try to apply the world's standards, you will always be disappointed in your walk with Christ because you will be expecting it to be easy when it never will. You know, sometimes God is really trying to do something for us and, and many of us are still standing in an experience that happened 20 years ago waiting for a repeat because it was such a glorious experience, such a wonderful uplifting. But God has moved on and is trying to bless us in another way. And often we are missing that blessing because it doesn't look like what happened 20 years ago. So true contentment is not putting our human expectations on things that God has for us. Romans eleven thirty three and 36. This is one of the scriptures that has just touched my soul years ago. It just made me realize that, that the natural heart, as 1 Corinthians two fourteen through 16 talks about, that you will never understand the wisdom of God for your life because the natural man cannot understand the spiritual things of God. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past find it out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall be recompensed to him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. He is our king. He is our counselor, and we will never go wrong if we stay in his footsteps through the storm, through the cactus, through the thickets. I have learned this from personal experience. Even in the desert, it is safer to have a drink of water once a day with God than to be at the oasis with the devil. This is the, the end of this little video. The start of a new day. And some days are filled with storms and agony. And as we gaze into the dark sky and see the hand of our Creator, remember that He is truly our God. And that the sun did come up. And that we are having a good day. Because our day doesn't mean right now. It is the day God has promised us that all things will be made new. And as we think about the scripture I just read, all we can do is cover our face, bow to the ground. As you enter into the presence of the eternal, self-existent one, how can we doubt his wisdom and his power? We forget sometimes that he is God. And that we forget that point. We really do. In the midst of our pain and our anguish, we must remember those who have gone before, who have lost their lives and given everything for the Lord that we all love. Let us be faithful and honor those who have gone before and to remember Christ has paid the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you so much for listening to these words and for visiting my channel. 
blessings on this day that the king has given you.